Sunday morning time to enter the 40. <laughs> Get some work done. And I want to document that that heavy snowfall of a couple days ago along with the high winds have self-pollarded a lot of the balsam firs. And there's one there. Lots of tops laying all over the place. Broke right off. You can see uh, one that withstood the weight and the wind, but now is hunched. So a couple of my deer runs that I produced over the, over the years now are blocked off. I'm going to grab my chainsaw and open them back up. I wanted to throw some of this brush into the water on these fingers on the pot and my glove came off and I thought, oh no I got it wet. <laughs> it stayed above the water. <laughs> Here's one of my mobile tree stand setups on the 40. And I gotta clear out a lane here for me to get in. This actually works out pretty good. I can brush up around here again. I don't want the deer to walk over here where I like to set up. The idea is I don't want the deer to come over here and sniff me if I've been in this tree. Which only happens once a year, but an opportunity to brush this up. <laughs> now you're gonna open up the pads that walk around this. There's one right there that's blocked off. You can see the balsam that fell down there. So I gotta open up those pads. So if a deer does walk by, it doesn't walk up to my tree, it walks around five yards away where I can shoot it so I can eat it. You see the brown needles of these balsam trees that I dropped a couple years ago to hold up the canary grasses and create some side cover for the deer. And I'm adding some more green ones to it. When we come over here we can see shh, got a whole bunch of them in here and created some real nice side cover. So right now this is an established trail that I made. You can see they really started using it once I made it. Yeah, and I gotta clean this up and then over there there's an opening where I have a licking branch. I gotta clean that up. The established path that I produced it does attract bucks, although probably a small one. And this isn't necessarily just about shooting a buck. But right there's my stand location. And I could pop it here. But this is the desired spot absolute kill spot right here. So we have a path that goes off in this direction and there's one that runs over here to the little vernal pool. And right here you'll be standing and I can go whap. That's it. Deer in the freezer. Why would I want to have a goat that I have to take care of when I can harvest a deer that takes care of itself? This is a licking branch I installed a couple years ago, maybe three years ago already. And I didn't have a camera on it last year. But in prior years, had a lot of action. Bucks, does, fawns all coming up and putting their noses to it. Bucks getting up in the, the branches there with their antlers. I got it kind of wore out, so I should probably enhance it a little bit somewhere down the line. But you see this balsam tree here fell down and stopped them from coming in from all directions. Of course, you know, this just happened a couple days ago. I'm going to clean it up. I think they like this little cedar patch. It's open, especially the does. They like bedding in here. And this will enclose it too much, I think. Right here, they, they really like that bedding area. Of course, during the rut, the bucks come and check them out. Out of battery juice. But we got it done. And these were the two that had fallen over. And you can see in the background, I put some tops. And I'll explain that in a second, but over here are some of the bigger pieces with just branches all over the place. So this was an open area that didn't really have a lot of tracks going through it. 
So I spruced it up a little bit. Now it's got some side cover. I'd like them to come from that direction because I have stand setups here. Here's one in particular. Right there where that Y. And I'd like them to walk right down this trail right here. One of these two. Three. There's another one over there. There's another one here. Four. There's another one over there. Five. Another one over here. Six. There's a lot of trails coming in here to the spot where the licking branch is. Just enough psyche. Not enough where they're uncomfortable where they can't see anything, but enough that they can jump one way or the other or zigzag around in here if they feel scared. And the coyote comes through. Three, four jumps over some brush piles and the coyote goes on his merry way. A deer habitat manager that I've watched in the past claims that if you line brush up like this where they can see through it to the other side, that, that makes them comfortable. These are all escape routes. They come in here. If this was all piled up with brush real high and they couldn't see on the other side, they wouldn't want to run that way. So that's why I piled them up here. You can see I piled old ones there years ago. Brown leaves and all. I'm enhancing all this. Over there. This is a trail that they started using once I did that. Right through here. My stand setup is in that cedar tree you can barely see in the background. But I want them to be really comfortable here because I've got this looking branch. And I want them to come visit. So I can set them up for the shot. I've ever only had one old buck come to it that I've got on video. And he came at night. <laughs> so it's a parade of young bucks. I, I got two and a half year olds and you know, I got stuff with racks beyond the ears, but nothing old. And I've been kind of leaving all this spot alone, hoping that the old ones will start using it. And I didn't put a trail camera on last year because that old one that came in at night, he looked up at the, at the camera. And then I never saw him again. So now I didn't want to put a camera up. So maybe I shouldn't put a camera here to find out. And the best part about that is I don't know that there's no old ones, so I'm excited to hunt. <laughs> How about that? This is one of the pads that I produced, I don't know, three, four years ago. And they're using it. It's kind of blocked off now from the snow pushing everything down, but I'm not, I'm not going to do any more work on it. You can see it really begins to become pronounced. And right here's the edge. So, follow this along. You can see it right there. Now, I filled some balsam fur over there and I made a path through it. You can see the segments that were cut out. They don't use that very much. But they started using this one a lot more. It made them feel comfortable to be using this. Of course this is heading over to the scrape. Well it looks like they made a little scrape right here. But uh, you see the path. I got one heading off into this thick brush. They're not using that as much. And look at this one. They're sticking on the edge. And they had a really nice path through here. Now the balsam firs decided to shed their tops. Yeah, that a couple of them are too long. I'm gonna have to get that little battery. Some of them are just fine right where they are. That track wasn't here this morning when I walked through. So they're hovering around here where I'm working. And we have raccoon tracks. There's one that's a little fatter toes. I think that's a possum. This is one of my favorite tamaracks I have had videos on with their nice pretty cones, leaves. And now it's gone. Yeah, it broke. It broke all the main roots so it isn't transplantable. Aww. 
You can see this sea berry bush got pulled up by the roots a little bit right here. It held on. It's bent over. This is a male. The sap suckers just go after those males like crazy. See all those little holes? Probably what you hear in the background. Another male right here. I don't know why they don't go after the females. But uh, these sea berries are, are uh, nitrogen fixers. And I've got apple trees and hazelnut trees uh, on this side of the access road, on the sun side of them. There's crab apple over there. I planted a lot in here, and most everything dies because of the canary grass, but you know, I don't care. I want tough plants, so you can't handle it, you gotta go away. I planted a bunch of peach pits in here last fall. We'll see if any of those come up. That'll be interesting. But like that apple tree, no problem for it. There's another one in the cage over there, no problem. A couple of hazelnuts in here too, but they're smaller. You go to the other side of this, and I got lots of plants growing on the shade side of this lineup of sea berries and it's because the sea berries are shading that ground and muting the canary grass. There's goldenrod in here which also has a chemical that'll kill off plants but they don't seem to bother the trees much. I've got pears and hazelnuts and crab apples, peaches. There's a nanking cherry in here I want to get out. Oh there's, this is a regular cherry. This is actually a German a German cherry, a German sour cherry that grows real tall. So it had blossoms last year but no cherries. Looks like I better take that tube off of there. It's too tight around the bottom though. The mice don't seem to bother cherries at all once they get a little larger. I'm not sure what that is. There might be a plum right there. Uh, maybe not. I don't know. I like it. I like to have a surprise. I don't know what I planted there. Let's find out when it fruits. <laughs> There's two pears over here that are really doing good. That's a that's a crab apple that has a very large apple. I believe I grafted that from a local tree here. See, this one's bent down now too from that heavy snow. I'm gonna have to pull it away from the, the access road and stake it. But here's a, two pairs that are really doing good. That's a nice pair, and that's a nice pair. They're all very tall. I've been trying to graft that mulberry in the back, but I think this year I'm going to have to do a bark graft. I'll try a bark graft. You can see all the tries that I had here. And I'm not grafting on the main trunk, which I think is another problem. So I'm going to cut that back severely and do a bark graft. It's a service tree I just planted. In the background here where that tube is, that's a Turkish hazelnut. Small hazelnuts that I think the birds are going to go nuts over. Birds and the squirrels. There were fierce winds a few days ago and finally broke off these trees that I cut three quarters through. They're dead ash and I don't want to cut them down. I don't want to actually fell them. I'm afraid something like that's going to happen. They just give out as you're cutting them and then psh, you're gone. And that is, you're dead. So I cut them about three quarters through, not even close enough to get them to start to sway. Just cut them three quarters, and this one I cut a year and a half ago. And I've been waiting for it to, to break, and finally those fierce winds broke it. Oh, that can be firewood. That's a black ash. And that right there definitely is a coon. See his toes are all sp spread out. Cleaning up these balsam fir tops is a diversion from what I had planned, which was transplanting trees. 
And I was walking back here with another battery. I was thinking, you know what? That's a lot of fun. Have to deal with something that was unexpected. Very interesting. I probably have an ancestor, and all of us have ancestors that were hunter gatherers, and probably closer genetically. <laughs> Every day is something unexpected when you're a hunter-gatherer. Very interesting to me. Lane produced by cutting segments out of the balsams that I put down. And you see the deer are too lazy to walk over here. I cut a segment over there so that they walk through that. <laughs> They're too lazy. So I think I'll just flip this one up over and let them walk along the edge. They want to be closer to the edge, I'll let them. Here's some droppings. Right here's a bedding spot. See, we kind of chewed up those cattails there. Top came off of the balsam first, so I stuck it in there. And when the wind's coming from this direction, I like to sit here. A tour of the work that I just accomplished here on this lane that I produce for the deer. And right here, we got a rub. So, you know, they've been in here. Right on the other side of that balsam over there is that bed. And then we head off into this direction. You see, I've got all these perpendicular lines of brush. So now as they're walking through here, they feel comfortable. They have escape routes everywhere. Both sides. This poor cedar tree got a lot of limbs busted off. It kind of worked out. We'll let that go like, like that. Nice little tunnel. More escape routes. Escape, escape, escape. The brush pile. Over here we have escape, escape, escape. Oh, I didn't finish this one. I gotta get at this one here yet. Open up that escape route. Come this side, we got escape. We have little narrow escapes, we have big wide escapes. Here's a really narrow escape right here. Right here. Probably for a little doll. I put some tops around the base of that basswood tree so that the bucks don't rub their antlers on them. And right here is the completed access path for deer. Wide enough even a moose can get his antlers through it. Moose in the UP? I guess so. I don't know if there's any around here. That'd be pretty cool though. The diversion work is concluded for the day. Now it's time to go transplant trees. Maybe even do a little gardening. This whole horseshoe here now has a trail around it. It's all brushed in. The perpendicular brush piles. All the way around. And you see the background, it's over there. And it comes out way over here. In the center is a little food plot. It's mostly wild plants, but if cut at the right time, they send up new shoots and become feed or food for the deer during rifle season. I'm experimenting with some stuff in there. I didn't want the deer to get in. And we have crab apples here. They're about the fruit any day now. That's where all the tubes are. In the background is a bear proof apiary. At some point I'm going to put a deer shack over the top of that to watch all this and someday I'll get bees again we'll see and I've learned from past experience with trail cameras in that I put a trail camera on the tree that I'm hunting and those deer will come back three weeks later and they're sniffing that tree and they come back at night so hunting even once wrecks the situation so I get a hunt on the right day maybe the right series of days where there's a lot of wind in the same direction for two or three days in a row then you can get away with it then I can get away with it so one hunt will change the equation it has to be thought about carefully planted two types of white clover and a three-year red clover in this area we got liftoff this is a thornless blackberry, 
and the deer are browsing it. It is winter browse food. Nice, that's why I planted it. I want to show it and I brought some transplants up. We've got a couple of hazelnuts and thornless blackberries, nanny berries. Uh, what else do we have in there? Nanking cherries. Service trees. Mountain ash. Uh, we'll wait till the warmth of the afternoon before we start.